I struggled for the longest time of thinking that I knew I knew best or I knew what was right. Completely wrong. But it was, you know, I was 15, I was 16. I'm like, yeah, I know what's best for my life at this age. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my time in middle school and high school and even going into college, I fully recognized the fact that I absolutely hated myself. I hated everything about what I was doing and I didn't know how to stop. What were the things that you were thinking and feeling um, as, as you were considering that attempt on your own life? I mean, a lot of what was going through my own head was nobody's going to miss me if I'm gone. Um, my, you know, they'll, yeah, they'll be sad in, in the moment, but they'll just as quickly move on because it had been that time of, you know, I had lost friends to, uh, to relationships and, and all of that. And so, you know, it was just a, okay, if they're just so, if they're just so easily able to drop me as a friend, they wouldn't care if I wasn't here at all. God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity, even just to be here together. And it's just a testimony of your goodness that no matter where we find ourselves, that you are never too far. And when we call upon your name, God, you're so faithful to show up and help us walk through every season of our lives. I'm reminded of the different prophets of scripture that you rescued, that you did profound and powerful things. I'm reminded of the story of Elijah in his battle um, not just against the enemy, but against himself. And uh, God, you had a, an incredible plan for him, just like you had for David. And uh, I just even pray that right now that you uh, you would encourage David as an Elijah, as somebody who has great power and great might, and yet uh, it wasn't short of having battles in his own mind, of his own thoughts and his own uh, lack of worthiness or um, his own ability. But God, we know that uh, you did magnificent works uh, through Elijah, just like you will uh, through David. And so I just pray today that people would be encouraged as they listen to his story, God, that they would even identify themselves uh, in that story. And God, that you are willing and able to rescue us from that pit um, and place us uh, as a son and daughter right next to you. And so we just say thank you and we pray this in your son's mighty and powerful name. Amen. Well, Amen. David, it's it's great to be with you. It's great to be and with you too. I'm excited to be able to share your story. For all of you that are watching, welcome to the Love Church Story Podcast. And I have an incredible friend with me today, um, David Douglas. Hey. My name is Pastor Adam. I'm the executive pastor here at Love Church. And uh, David and I, we have the honor of working together every day. So much. I love it. And uh, David is our broadcast director here at Love. And so uh, it's it's an incredible honor for me to share this story because over the last three years, I've gotten to walk part of this journey with you and see it kind of unfold in real time. It's been a wild journey. It, it has had its moments oh, of yeah. ups and downs. <laughs> and um, even your story to being on staff here yeah. has been a unique one. And um, man, just super grateful for the impact that you've had. And um, I think as people are watching, I think my my deepest desire, I mean, really both of us would be that people would see themselves, even in your story, mm -hmm. that, you know, for you, that it, it feels like an unlikely of circumstances that you would be here. And yet look at what God is doing. Oh, yeah. And it's just beginning. Oh, and yeah. um, so I, I want to go back and as we kind of open up today, you know, for you, you, you were sharing with me that you grew up in a Christian home and the that kind of impact in your story. Um, tell me, just tell me a little bit more about your childhood and yeah, totally. And being at home with both of your parents. Yeah. So to take it, you know, way, way back, uh, I was originally born in Canada. I'm the only Canadian on staff, but, uh, we moved to the States when I was two years old. So while I am more American than I am Canadian, I'm not a citizen. It's true. Um, but my family for, generations going back have been just the strongest, most passionate believers. Um, and so grew up in a, in a home where both of my parents were 
were and still are very, very strong believers. And, you know, like we go back to, I had a great, great grandfather who was a traveling missionary back in Scotland. Wow. Um, the table that we used in our Easter promo video was the same table that he wrote his sermons on. Uh, so that there's mm. just a really special connection yeah. to that old part of my life all the way to now. And so, yeah, it was, you know, I grew up in a, in a really strong Christian home. Every, uh, all of my siblings were all saved at a very, very early age. I mean, I remember it was, I was five years old on my way home from a soccer game, which was literally just down the road from my house. When I said to my mom, I was like, Hey, I think I want to get saved. And so I got saved in the back seat of my Dodge Grand Caravan <laughs> on my way home from a soccer game. Like you do. It's you it, it's this whole thing of like, it's not a very profound testimony, but it's a testimony nonetheless. Yeah. Um, it's a testimony for a five-year-old and it's very cute. Yeah. It's interesting though, right? Because the the beautiful thing about that is like it lays an incredible foundation yeah. of knowledge and understanding. But the challenge of that is, and, and you and I both know that having knowledge of God and having even that moment isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so the the challenge even in that is, you know, you're you're getting a little bit older, you're progressing, you're you're now into middle school and high school. And uh, I don't know about you, middle school isn't always the most fun time. Not in the slightest. Tell, tell me a little bit more about just your experience with adolescence and growing up yeah. and having friends and kind of that, you know, ha seems to be a challenge for a lot of young believers. So, I mean, for me, like that middle school, high school, or at least middle school, early high school age of me, I was, I mean, I was a punk where it's the, you know, like I'm listening to, I'm listening to, uh, like heavy, heavy metal music. I'm, you know, wearing, uh, wearing all black. Not that I do it anyway, anymore. It's at, true at this point in my life, but that's a production thing. But it was, I was just in the season of rebelling against, um, everyone and everything that was in my way. And so, you know, like, oh, my parents had a rule growing up where I wasn't allowed to date anybody in high school. Uh, I dated a new girl every year and would lie to my parents for a couple of months until they would find out, and then I would get grounded, and then I would move on to the next girl. I was not a good person at that point in my life. Yeah. Even though I was still involved in my church, I was still, um, at that point, I was serving on our youth worship team, but I was in this cycle of, I was basically just putting on a front yeah. to appease my parents in the slightest way of like, hey, I'm still being a good Christian boy, I'm going to serve on the worship team. I'm going to play guitar. But all the while, it's I'm finding every single possible out to do that. And so it was, you know, then eventually I got a job selling suits and I would find a way to get scheduled on Wednesday evenings and Sunday mornings. So that way I could have an excuse to, oh, I can't go to church today because yeah. I have to go to work. Tell me, I want to know what, what were those conversations with your parents like? Because I can't imagine that they were a lot of... Uh, fun. Maybe. Like when I told them that I couldn't go to church that Sunday? Well, I, even, even the, you know, let's just go back to even just the dating girls, you know, yeah. like, you know, you're in middle school and high school, they're grounding you. I just would love to hear some of like, what did that, what did those conversations look and feel like? They were never good in any way, shape or form. It was basically just a, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this. We have explicitly told you that you are not supposed to be doing this. There is nothing good that can come from dating somebody in high school, especially dating somebody that's not a believer. Yeah. And that was the thing where I, it, none of the girls that I had ever dated were, were believers. And so, you know, it's, I had this, albeit while I was rebelling away from God, I still had this savior complex mm. of thinking, oh, this person believes this thing. I can save them and turn them over yeah. to Christ and make them somebody that my parents will approve of. For sure. I, I would be curious, like how, how has that impacted your relationship with authority in your life over the years? Because that, right, like them kind of setting the hard line and you saying, hey, I've rebelled. Like, tell me a little bit about how God has kind of redeemed that in you. Yeah, I mean, it was, I struggled. I struggled for the longest time of thinking that I knew I knew best or I knew what was right, completely wrong. But it was, you know, I was 15, I was 16. I'm like, yeah, I know what's best for my life at this age. 
Yeah. Um, and I know what I want to do for myself. That's going to make me happy. I'm going to feed into these things that are worldly, that are impure because they're giving me this satisfaction Albeit that was all temporary satisfaction that yeah. faded almost as quickly as it was as it was received. So what you're saying is it didn't actually make you happy. No, never. Tell me, like, tell me about that kind of journey, right? You're you're spending time kind of um, investing your life into those things, really hoping that man, this would be it. Like, mm-hmm. hey, this Jesus thing, it's great. I I understand it, but this seems way more fun. Mm-hmm. And on on the flip side, you just mentioned like it didn't make you happy. What was what was that journey like of revelation that man, this isn't fun? So I mean, at the time, it was it was fun, and it would yeah. feel it would feel good. But I would get so consumed in myself, and a lot of people that know me personally, they know my battle with uh, with mental health and with my own self worth. Yeah. Um, and so it was, I mean, a lot of my time in middle school and high school and even going into college, I fully recognized the fact that I absolutely hated myself. I hated everything wow. about what I was doing and I didn't know how to stop. And at that point, I was such a people pleaser that I would continue to do the things that I would do because it would make the people that were around me also happy. Yeah. Like one example that I shared with you was there was a girl that I had been dating and it was the same situation where, you know, I dated, I started dating her and had this idea that I was going to save her. Well, she had prior to us dating already been dealing with her own battle of mental health and had been on a bed of suicide and that didn't stop. And so it got to a point where she was threatening to take her own life. She would basically send me pictures of the cuts that she had put on herself. And that brought me so low because I was trying to make this girl happy, but I was failing. And so it led me to my own to my own struggle and to my own eventual attempt at taking my own life. Uh, fortunately, it was very unsuccessful, but I just remember lying on the floor of my bathroom in a, uh, just in a pool of tears. And I mean, I, I didn't go through with it, but it like, it was just realizing at that moment, there's so much more yeah. than what I'm in right now. I want to know, um, I think for so many people watching, they've had moments of desperation. Yeah. I would love to hear from you. What 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 was the internal dialogue like in those moments leading up to that? You know, what what were the things that you were thinking and feeling as as you were considering that attempt on your own life? I mean, a lot of what was going through my own head was nobody's going to miss me if I'm gone. Hmm. My you know, they'll yeah, they'll be sad in, in the moment, but they'll just as quickly move on. Cause it had been that time of, you know, I had lost friends to, uh, to relationships and, and all of that. And so, you know, it was just a, okay, if they're just so, if they're just so easily able to drop me as a friend, they wouldn't care if I wasn't here at all. And so it was a lot of that was going through my head and, um, and, but eventually it was just basically getting, and this is 100% a from God communication of there is a future for you. There is a plan for you. Just wait. Yeah. And so it was, you know, the, okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to be angry, but I'm going to wait and basically just bitterly go day to day with still with this desire, yeah, but you know, refusing to do anything about it. Yeah, I'm just I'm reminded that it's it's interesting because Paul writes about this over and over again. Like, God, take this thorn away from me. Yeah, like, and I'm just really moved right now that you know God is big enough to handle every emotion. Yeah, like it's you were angry and 
yet that didn't that doesn't turn God away from you. Mm-hmm. That there were there were things you were experiencing even in that moment that were incredibly heavy, and yet at the same time, in that moment, He's so faithful to show up and and there's a even through that. Um, I hope people are encouraged that there isn't a moment that in even in in the midst of that that he didn't care so deeply about you. Yeah. And I want to know where in that journey do you feel like you had fallen away from faith in Christ and what because you know later on you know that moment happens but kind of leading up to that what do you feel like were maybe some of the moments where you said hey you began to just push push away. So the really key moment that uh so all of that happened my junior year of high school the key moment that really pushed me away from god happened a year prior Mm. and i've struggled a lot with blaming myself for other people's circumstances and it took up until probably within the last six or so years Mm. so my grandmother died very very suddenly my sophomore year of high school. At the time, I had been dating a different girl. And so I blamed myself for her, for my grandmother dying as God punishing me Mm. for sinning against my parents and sinning against him. I just want to let let that sink in. Mm -hmm. I blamed myself for my grandmother dying because I was sinning. And I didn't even stop dating that girl until a couple of months later when I got caught. And so uh, that was what really started to, started this trend of me just hating, hating God. I wanted nothing to do with him. I wanted nothing but to get out of that church, to get out of Christianity because it had brought me nothing but pain it had brought me nothing but heartache, and so I was I was sick with, I was sick of it. I was done with it, and it wasn't until I got to college that I found it again. What was the, so, you know, as you were stepping out of that situation and the blame and guilt, and I I love your renewed perspective on that moment that it wasn't really God at work in that moment. You know your grandma's situation and your life they although connected were very different yeah and you know that journey back to faith going to college obviously that's a new beginning for a lot of people Mm -hmm. and it makes you reevaluate a lot of things and reconsider a lot of things tell me tell me what was the pivotal moment of you going from that season of okay i'm angrily waiting to now your willingness to step foot back into church for the first time. I graduate high school and I go off to college and I'm going to college down in Lincoln, uh, you know, so far away from home. Um, But I had made the commitment to myself that when I went down to college, I was going to become a new person. Granted, that (laughs) new person was not a believer. I'm like, I'm going to do what David wants to do. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sin. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, have have sex. I'm going to do, I'm going to drink. I'm going to do drugs. I'm going to do, but then, you know, it was no satisfaction. And so, yes, I turned away from God, but now I'm even more depressed than I had been when I was still with God. Yeah. And so I'm like, what is this dichotomy that's going on here? Right. That clearly something isn't working. Um, And all along, my parents have been pressing into me like, hey, son, have you found a new church? Have like, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm still looking. I haven't found one that I really liked yet. I hadn't gone to a single church, but then eventually they sat down with me and they were like, "We're gonna find you a church." And so we go through this whole list and we find all of these churches that are within the Christian and Missionary Alliance because that was the church affiliation that I had grown up a part. Well, I'd grown up a part of after we left the Brethren Church. If you want to know more about that, that's a crazy story, but. Uh, so we find Lincoln Berean church and I go there. Um, I go to the actual church for a Sunday and, uh, I go in, there's a front desk lady and I'm like, hi, I'm new here. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, guide me. And she's like, well, go in here, sit through the message. And then when you're done, come out and find me. Well, I sit through the message and it is 
incredible. Amazing worship, a powerful message. I don't remember what it was about, but it was powerful. And so I go out there and I'm like, all right, that's cool. What do you have for college kids? She's like, oh, well, we have this college ministry called Campus Impact that meets down just off of campus yep. that you should go to. And so I start going um, and I'm still kind of, you know, one foot in, one foot out. And so it gets to this point where it's like, you know, I show up, I sit in the back, I listen, and then I leave immediately. I don't talk to anybody other than there was one girl that I knew from high school that went there. And so I would maybe say hi to her, but then I would leave immediately. Well, so that goes on for like about a month. And then it gets to being clo- coming up to fall break. And this whole time I'm going there and they're, you know, repping this like, hey, guys, over fall break, we're going to be going on this. Uh, we're going to be going on this trip out to the mountains in Colorado. And we're going to have a whole like cool religious experience. And I my birthday is always over fall break. And I share my birthday is the same day as my parents anniversary. And my parents were going to be going on a cruise for their anniversary. So they weren't going to be here. Um my brothers had both gone off or were both doing their own things over fall break. My sister, I think, was in a different city at the time. And so I'm like, okay, nobody's going to be here. That's depressing. I might as well go on this trip with these complete strangers that I don't know. Come to find out, I make some of the best friends I've had in my entire life wow. within the first 15 minutes of that trip where... Um, you know, I get into the, I get into the van to start driving there and sit next to these dudes and I just start talking to them and we're just vibing and I'm like, oh, I can, I can gel with these guys. Ended up moving in with one of them uh, a little later that year. But, um, on that trip, like there's a whole thing in Christianity about your mountaintop experiences where you have those really, really spiritual highs that fill up that fire in your heart but then you go back down to the valley and everything sucks. But I literally had the mountaintop experience of standing on the top of a mountain and rededicating my life to Christ, where it was a, I see what it is that you have laid out for me. Yeah, I see this promise that you have been fulfilling within my life, in the background, in ways that I didn't even see at the time. Yep. Um, And so it's then I come down from that mountain and I'm like, I'm bought in. I'm here. I'm ready to go. Send me. And so then I go throughout the rest of my year that year. I move in with a friend of mine. I end up getting kicked out of college that year as well um, because I kind of failed a lot of my classes. It was a whole thing of, you know, yeah, you have your mountaintop experience. You're still going to battle with depression if you have that. And so I was doing that. Yeah. So I got really hooked on Grey's Anatomy and not going to not going to class. That'll um, do it. That'll do it. I'm just, I'm, I'm so intrigued as you were talking because I felt like there's some really key moments in that journey of number one, your parents have continued to be faithful Yeah. now for 18 years of your life to invest in you mm-hmm. one step at a time. Not always perfect, mm-hmm. not always exactly the way you wanted, but they were consistent. It wasn't the way that I wanted it, right? but it was the way that it needed to be given to me. That's which is the big wow. thing that I think a lot of people need to notice. Listen to your parents. <laughs> and my mom is going to comment and say, yeah, you should have listened to me. It's true. Um, I told you so. But listen to your parents, because as much as you think they don't have what's best for you in their heart, yeah. they always do. For sure. And you're coming, you you find your way into Berean Number one, I think for so many people that are even may stumble across this video, encouragement, man, find a life giving church wherever yeah, you are and 100%. just show up. If nothing else, just to see what happens. Yeah. Like just give God a chance. You did that. And along the way, I think even that of your willingness to go on fall retreat, I think so many people, they're convinced in 2024, it's just me and God. Yeah. When in reality, so much transformation really begins and ends in community, yeah, community totally. of believers, friends, people that keep you connected to the vine. People that hold you accountable. For sure. And so I wanna kind of jump ahead and just ask you, you know, you saved when you were young, you recommit your life in, uh, in college, you really go all in and surrender your life. Tell me what has changed over the last, you mentioned six years. 
Like what has really changed over the last six years? I mean, so I get kicked out of college and I moved back, I moved back home and it was the whole thing of, you know, yeah, I was sad in the moment, but I, at that point I was like, okay, cool. God has a different plan here. Clearly it wasn't in Lincoln. So I need to find what's next. Yeah. And so it was then I spent the next few years kind of bouncing between a couple of different churches. Um, I had started dating a girl who uh, was a believer and her and I had found one church together, started going there for a little bit. Um, but then it was the whole thing of, I didn't think I was getting a deep enough impact from them. Yeah. Um, and so as we left that and then we're bouncing around between a couple of different churches around Omaha. Well, so at the time I had been working at, uh, working at Nebraska Furniture Mart selling TVs. Um, you know, good time. I have way yep. too much knowledge about TVs and sound systems. Random. And random stuff. Um, but so she had been working there as well. And she had a friend who had started going to Love Church and was absolutely loving it. And so she gets the girl that I was dating to go. And yeah. she goes and she's like, holy cow, this thing is awesome. David, you need to come here. Um, and so then the next Sunday that I had off, I went and that was back when we were at Millard North. Um, and I'm like, whoa, this is a different experience. And it was, you know, immediately we're getting into the word, we're getting connected. We're just like, it was such an on fire experience. And I'm like, I can get behind this. Yeah. And so we go back and then we go back and then I get on the worship team. And for those that remember 2019 Love Church, there was this uh, guy, usually at that point in time, I was fairly well-dressed because I would have to usually go to work afterwards, um, but playing guitar, jumping around stage, and absolutely loving what I was getting to do. Wow. Um, because it wasn't, it wasn't a performance for me. It was a, I'm having a moment of worship and connection yeah. with, uh, with God. And, um, you know, I think about it in, in the way of as a guitar player, you know, when you're setting up to play guitar, you have to plug your guitar into an amp. Well, while you're also plugging your guitar into an amp, you have to plug yourself into, um, into a connection with God. Yeah. Because then, you know, if I've, I've, I don't do that then when I'm going into worship, at that point, I'm just doing it for myself. I'm not yeah. doing it for him. And so that's a moment of any time before I get on stage, I have to take that second yep. to really just connect with God and you know make sure that, you know, am I doing this for him or am I doing this for me? Yeah. I just want to drill down a little, a layer deeper. Yeah. I think if I'm sitting on the other side of the screen, I'm asking my question myself the question, Okay, David, you you attempted suicide in high school. Yeah. How have your thoughts changed? You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to lie and say that they went away immediately. Uh I mean, I can I can think all the way back to or like as early as, you know, within the last 6 months that I've had moments where that thought has still crossed my mind. Yeah. It's not nearly as strong, it's not nearly as often, but it's still there. Uh, like mental health is not something that is a one and done for somebody. It's something that you learn to just sort of live with and you make changes in your life to adjust for and compensate for those feelings. And so if it's, you know, I'm in a moment where I'm feeling lost and I'm feeling alone, then what I need to do is I need to get surrounded. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, oh, I'm feeling really, really alone in this season. I need to get with my friends yeah. that I know are going to set me on the right path. They're going to give me that, that little fuel that I need to just go another season. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely never been something that's left my head and I don't want it to. 
um, I think I think it's something that I that identifies me as a person. Hmm. The fact that yeah, I deal with I deal with mental health on a daily basis. What would you say? You know, I the cool part is I get to work with you a lot. Yeah, and you know, I just want to commend you. One of the things that I felt like you've grown so much in in this last season is your ability to be vulnerable. One hundred percent. And when those moments are happening, for you not to feel like this is uh, something that I have to just take on myself or figure out or I need to work through. For you, I, I'm curious, like even in that of like, what it, you, know, you mentioned specifically your identity. Yeah. Like, man, I, I felt really worthless. Like how has God really began to transform even your own self-worth and your own, um, even your own self-image? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing for that is God has given me the ability to recognize that I am more than just me. There is a lot more going on in here, in here, that is just David. There is God flowing through me. There yeah. is that power of connection and community and the way that I can speak to and interact with people that gives me the ability to really just be able to completely take myself out of the situation yeah. of, oh, I'm not feeling good right now. That's fine. I can recognize that and I can move on. For sure. I would just be curious, you know, as we kind of wrap up our, our discussion today, thank you so much for sharing such yeah. a big part of your story. You've been on, uh, on our staff, both as a contractor and now full time for about the last year. And it's been kind of an interesting journey of you professionally speaking. You know, I, many of you guys that work around the United States know that the job market is ever changing. Oh yeah. And so, um, it was an opportunity you were contracting with us. We brought you on the team. I would be curious. Um, this is, it's like being in a group on steroids oh. in the sense that you're around us all the time. We're in the studio with our team even right now. Yeah. And I would just be curious for you to share how is being a part of the team? How has that changed your life? Uh, it's changed my life in ways that I could never have imagined it doing so. I mean, I've made some of the best friends that I could ever ask for. I mean, Burke, I'm staring at him right now. I mean, he's become my best friend mm. in the sense that... Maybe a big brother. No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, like, in the sense that, one, he'll call me out when he sees that I'm struggling with something. Yeah. Um, and I can do the same thing with him. But I, like... I can just come to him if I need, you know, I need a shoulder to cry on. I need advice. I need, and that's just been this whole entire experience with everybody on the team of, it's just like, I, you know, yes, I have a physical family, but I also now have this spiritual family in, in the Love Church staff. And yeah, it's, you know, there's some days that I come into our meetings and I'm on a, I'm on a low that day. Um, but then it's, I have one interaction completely shifts my entire mentality for the day. Wow. Yeah. I would just ask you, if, you know, as we wrap up, like if there's anything else that you wanted to share, um, with the people that are watching, maybe something that we missed or, um, something you would want to just tell people that are watching today. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I know that we didn't, uh, we didn't touch on that I think is really, really important to touch on is addiction in 2024. Um, and I mean, I'm all completely like to preface, um, pornography has been a very big struggle of mine for what's 2024 now. When did the iPod come out? Uh, that was 2007. Probably. Yeah. Um, and I had, I had mentioned this, um, a couple of months ago and it just became very profound to me. Uh, basically, Steve Jobs is the godfather of modern day porn addiction hmm. because creating or creating the iPhone and the iPod opened up a whole new realm of possibility for ease of access to porn. Mm -hmm. And it's been, you know, it's, it's been something that, 
I mean, I struggled with it all the way from like 2009, 2000 and 2008, 2009, um, all the way up until, I mean, realistically within about the last year and a half, um, there's been some seasons lately that have, that, you know, it's been a little bit worse, a little bit harder. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, it's an absolutely abominable thing that's just become so wildly accessible. Right. And being in the position that I'm in where so much of my life and so much of today's life is spent online. Yeah. It's, you know, you really have to close your eyes to most of what you see online because most of what it is that we're seeing online on TV isn't what God wants for us to see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think as we wrap up my encouragement for those of you that are watching, you know, David, your story, I feel like is one of identity purification. Yeah. And even as you were sharing there, I, I can't help but think and ask the question to every person that's watching, what, what hole in your identity are you filling with something that is from the world? Yeah. And the beautiful thing is God wants to speak that identity into you. He is speaking that identity into you right now. But I know there are people, myself included, and everyone that's watching that has had a moment in their life where, I mean, there was something that they were trying to cram into that hole, whether it was dating or um, even you sharing a little bit about feeling worthless. Yeah. And, you know, even in that, there are so many things in our world vying for our attention, playing to our sensibilities, wanting you to fall into that, whether it's addiction or um, even just consumption, that I would, I would just even ask and hope that this story of rededication and going all in and watching you take step after step, getting to in real time, watch you take step after step of just committing. The, the Bible would say this is the sanctification process, right? Yeah. Like this is the one day at a time. God, I love you. I'm surrendered to you. I'm not always going to get it right, but I'm going to take the next right step. And even on that journey that people would just take a moment today as they're watching this to consider, man, what what is that place in me yeah. that I have to turn over what are the things, what are, what are merely the symptoms, right? Pornography at the end of the day is a symptom. Yeah, It's, hey, I have something going on in my identity that I'm trying to fill. Totally. And so I, I would just ask, and I just want to pray that over people today. Can we do that? Yeah, totally. God, I just thank you so much for David. I thank you for his story, your willingness to, to meet him in the darkest of moments. And yet at the same time, how beautiful is it that you would meet him on the mountaintop? And I just pray over every single person watching this story today that they would be encouraged that God is willing and able to meet them in every single one of those moments. God, I pray identity over every person watching that there would be just right now, you would make a deposit in their heart and in their mind yes. of the son and daughter that they are, that there's nothing missing, nothing lacking, that when you went to the cross, salvation in the Greek literally means healed and forgiven. God, that there is healing flowing through the camera today, that you're healing people's hearts and their minds, that there are new neuro pathways being formed. There, there are places of pain, God, that you desire to take away if we'll just turn it over to you. And I'm thankful for David, his willingness to, to share his testimony. God, you say that we're, we are healed by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. God, would this testimony go far and wide that it would encourage so many people we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, man. Yeah, you It's so good man. chatting with you. It's been great. Love you, bro. Love you.